I'll talk really quick. I can do that because I know I'm the last thing. Actually, Mike is the last thing between you and the uh, you and the reception, so we definitely don't want to hold you up there. Linda had made a comment that she'd gone through a lot of the thick um, the thick evaluations to to kind of get a lot of ideas. And as a consultant that was the author, uh, our company was the author of two of the evaluations. The reason they're thick is because they look better than if they're thin. So we always, it always looks better to the client to have a thicker document. Um, they might get you, to, they might say the same thing, but it works out pretty well. Um, Linda's kind of asked me to, um, uh, let's see. There we go, that's the slide. Okay, Linda's asked me to kind of talk about some of our experiences in the field in uh, some of the impact evaluations. And anytime you talk about evaluations in the Northwest, it's a very, very dangerous subject because there's probably been more evaluation work on codes and buildings here in the Northwest than anywhere else in the country, primarily funded by Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. And I know there's some ringers out in the audience right now. They're just waiting for me to say something. Yes, like David. So. Um, We've been involved, uh, as a company, Britt Mackler Group has been involved in a few impact evaluations, uh, one in Nevada that was actually under contract to uh, ICBO, then turned over to ICC, uh, residential one in Iowa, the same uh, ICBO, ICC contractor, and then a commercial one in Indiana, um, just because they wanted to know what, what they needed to do to update to actually to adopt a commercial energy code in Indiana. We've also done some other assessment programs that have been involved, uh, some with funding from Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, like our site education program um, that was actually funded by NIA and uh, started out in I um, I Idaho, um, and then shot, uh, off, an offshoot of that went to Nevada and Utah, and also we've been involved in some phone survey work on codes work too. Uh, one is in Colorado with, that was funded by Eastar Colorado, and the other was a, a follow, some follow-on work we had originally done in Iowa that was, um, we had, uh, were contracted by Cadmus, which was for, formerly Quantech. So we've been involved in a, uh, several of the, uh, the energy code um, programs that have happened in the country. I wanted to talk about a few because it's important as you're going out there to figure out what some of the pitfalls are, how you should leverage things, uh, what works, what doesn't work. Um, the first one we'll talk, uh, I'll talk about is the Nevada Residential Energy Baseline Study. And the, the, the question we were trying to ask, uh, answer in uh, Nevada is, where are they now? What do they need to do to upgrade to more current codes? Uh, this was a primary question. We didn't get into energy savings. It was a basic thing of where do you stand right now with energy code compliance? What do you need to do if you want to update to the 1995 model energy code or the 2000 IECC in the state? Um, that was a prime question that the uh, Nevada State Office of Energy needed to know. So we looked at 200 homes, which is substantially more than the, uh, the 44 homes you're going to be asked to look at under this one. Um, 160 of the homes were in southern Nevada, and the 60 were in northern Nevada, primarily in the Reno area. We did plan review for all 200 homes. Uh, we did on-site inspection, and we did blower door testing. And the blower door testing wasn't part of the code. We just thought it was a neat thing to add just so we could see how buildings were performing, how, how tight buildings were being built in the state. Um, that's probably not something that you're going to be asked to do, I would assume, for the 90% evaluation work. Uh, but it's, it's a good thing to, to know. Um, we looked at 10 jurisdictions, which were really the bulk of the jurisdictions in the state of Nevada. Um, and we had a, uh, an in-state field team. We actually used her certified raters as our data collection people. They already knew energy, they were already there. We had one up north, one down south. They were easy to train on the energy code, so we decided to leverage off of existing resources that were actually in the state. In our analysis tool, we used MechCheck. Uh, not a sophisticated tool, but again, it gave us a good snapshot and able, able, gave us the ability to analyze buildings very quickly to see exactly where we were with, from a compliance standpoint, which is again, what, what the, the client wanted on this particular one. Some of the lessons learned, some of the, the, our successes, um, some of the issues. Uh, we were able to build relationships with, with the jurisdictions. And this is something that was a side benefit we didn't think about. But at the time we had gone into the state of Nevada, there was some strained relationships between the state energy office and a lot of the jurisdictions and a lot of the building community. So this actually gave us the ability to go meet with the jurisdictions, uh, gather some information, kind of get that relationship built up. And again, we weren't planning on doing this, it just seemed to work out. Um, so that worked out very well. Um, as a company, our general goal is if we're gonna write a report, we don't want it to sit on a shelf and collect dust. Otherwise, it's really not a reason to write the report. 
So we wanted to make sure the report was going to be used. And actually, this report that we wrote was kind of the basis for getting codes up and running in the state of Nevada and getting uh, Southern Nevada folks on board with adopting more uh, better codes and also the, the folks up in Northern Nevada, too. So we were able to collect the data and then through, again, just using MacCheck, figure out what they need to do to comply with more current codes. Uh, that's what they wanted to do, how much more insulation, what kind of windows and that type of thing. So that worked out really well. Um, Contrary to popular belief, the, the builders don't always like to cooperate with these types of studies. Now, we think that they're going to be open, come, we're, we're all going to go out there and they're, they're going to open their arms up and say, come on to my job site, we want you to look to see what we're doing. Um, it worked in northern Nevada, in southern Nevada we were shut out for most of the jobs. So the 140 buildings we looked at in um, southern Nevada, we got on 20 sites, 15 sites, something like that, and we had to have a contingency plan, which is figure out how to get the rest of the data. Um, so even the best laid plans fell flat on this particular one, and this was a big issue. We had to scramble and re-figure re out how, how best to do this to get, the, uh, to get more cooperation from the builders or to get data that was going to be meaningful. Um, carrots work really well with the jurisdictions. No, they're not vegetarians, but in this case, uh, they like it if you come in and say, by the way, we're going to take up a lot of your time by looking at plans and getting out in the field, but we'll give you training. Okay, we'll give you free training on this. And that works out really well. They want, they want something in return for their time because you're asking them to take up their manpower. You're asking them to potentially sit in their office for a couple of days doing plan review and then potentially tap into their inspectors out in the field. And there needs to be something in return to this. So definitely. This, has worked, this worked out pretty well with the jurisdictions. Iowa, we learned a lot in Nevada, and we tried to take what we learned in Nevada and, and um, use what we learned in, in Iowa. In Iowa, the study was a lot smaller. It was only about uh, 65 homes or 65 buildings total, uh, 47 single family. Uh, we actually anticipated on doing more of that, but what we didn't anticipate when we got into Iowa was to do multifamily. And the multifamily, we saw an opportunity to get into multifamily buildings to see what's actually going on there. And so we jumped on that. Um, the Department of Natural Resources there said, yes, this is a great thing because we don't know anything about multifamily what's, uh, in Iowa. Um, we did plan review on all the buildings. We did on-site inspection and we did blower door testing in as many of the many of the buildings as we could get into to do blower door testing. And there were some weather issues and things like that, so we couldn't test every, every building in Iowa. We looked at about 10 jurisdictions, and we also looked at two community colleges that were actually had a builders building program. They were building way above code, but they wanted us to come in there to check out their buildings and to provide training and things like that. So we looked at this as a good opportunity to build relationships between DNR and the actual community colleges. So that worked out well. Um, in this case, we used an out-of-state field team. So our field team was actually from Las Vegas. Pros and cons with that, the downside with that is um, they can't always get there when the house is ready to be inspected. Um, so we found out the pitfalls of using out-of-state field teams for our on-site data collection. The plan review, we were all out-of-state too, but it's easier to collect data from plan review. You have a little bit more latitude. So that was one of the things we saw in this. We also... Um, for our analysis tool, we used ResCheck. So just uh, at that time, ResCheck was out, and so we were able to use that. The things that we learned from Nevada that we were able to use in Iowa, for one thing, we had a lot more collaboration with the ICC chapter there and also with the Home Builders Association. We got them on board from day one. This made a huge impact on getting us out on site so we could actually get the data we needed to do. And they were, they were involved. We, we did uh, reporting back to them and things like that. Um, we learned a lesson that just because the plans don't show information doesn't mean that the building still doesn't comply. Um, what we saw in Iowa was that, and I think as one gentleman attested, there's a lot of areas that don't have, they don't have code enforcement in Iowa. Um, so we, we saw the plans and the plans didn't really show a whole lot, but when we got out in the field and started doing data collection, we realized that those houses were, they were built very well. A lot of them had 90% furnaces. We found out there was a Pella window manufacturing plant in Iowa, and guess what they put in? They put in Pella windows. So it actually worked out pretty well. So the compliance rates we got from the field far exceeded what we could possibly get on the building plans just because of lack of information. And so that was really a learning process for us. We, um, we also learned that we should have gone with an in-state data collection team because again, when the, when the house is ready to inspect, you need to be out there to do it. And that's, that's a key thing. So as you're thinking about the process, think in state from a data collection process for your field team. Um, soliciting building cooperation. Um, 
we actually were, had the um, jurisdictions get builder cooperation. They actually signed a letter saying, yes, we could come out on site before we, did, we, uh, we were able to do that. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that's self-selection self and only the best builders are going to want you on there, but it's better than Southern Nevada where we couldn't get out on a, you know, the bulk of what we selected out there. And so this is, it was kind of the good with the bad. Um, just because the plans are in, the building department doesn't mean that it's built or accessible. We pulled some plans when we got out in the field that was already occupied. Okay, it's very difficult to go into a home and start doing inspections when the residents are already, they've already beat you there. So, so we learned this and sometimes the jurisdictions didn't exactly know the status of the, the building either. They might pull a permit and never build the house. Okay, we learned this too. So this is where oversampling is probably going to come in as you, as you get into the process. With Indiana, uh, this was our, our only avenue into commercial uh, energy code compliance, but Indiana wanted to know, they wanted to adopt the 2000, actually ASHRAE 90.1, 1989, and get into the I codes that way. And they re didn't really know where their commercial buildings um, commercial building sat from an energy code compliance standpoint. So we looked at 43 commercial projects uh, and an, an additional 18 multifamily because in Indiana, multifamily was a commercial building. So this was, a, uh, we did plan review and we did on-site inspection. The different twist on this one is the on-site inspectors were the state commercial inspectors. They were already working for the state, they had access to the buildings and they were the state inspection crew and we could tap into their resources. So uh, we actually were working with the Indiana Department of Commerce on a DOE grant on this one, and we said, what a great resource. Let's, let's get the people that are out there the whole time to actually do the work for us. And so this worked out quite well. Uh, we used ComCheck as the analysis tool on this one. Um, we had to train the on-site inspectors. Okay, well, you're going to have to do training anyway. The, down, the, good, the good news on this is they already knew buildings. They already knew what, where the buildings were. They had access to the buildings. The downside is they didn't really know the energy code because they hadn't had to deal with this before. So you have to, we had to provide training. We did about uh, a day to a day and a half of training in the classroom, and then we were out on the field actually doing audit training so the, the inspectors knew exactly what they needed to look for out there. Um, this helped out a lot because, again, the inspectors had to inspect every aspect. They had to be out there in every phase, and so we were able to send them out there and with, the, uh, with the data collection form, and they could collect the data because they were, they were on site for either foundation or for, uh, for rough and electrical or whatever they were out there for. So that worked out really well. Um, one of the lessons we learned is you have to be clear about the data that needs to be collected very clear from day one because as we this project evolved we went from we want you to look at everything to maybe you shouldn't look at everything why don't we look at just the things that we can't find on the plans because we had all of the commercial building plans out there so we kind of modified our our process as we went along with this one we still i think got to it got to a good spot, um, area you also need to document assumptions i am notorious for changing things in the middle of a project um, gee, I, I, I'm always saying, I look at data and say, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we knew about this or that or something like that? And it drives my partner nuts. Um, so document all your assumptions because sometimes you're not going to be able to get the data in the field. Um, built up roofing on a commercial building, for example, once it's laid, how do you know how thick the built up roofing is? You don't. I mean, as far as your insulation levels go. So it's a hard information to get out there. As Linda brought up, how do you know about NFRC rating for site built windows? If they've never been rated, you have no idea what they are. Um, so there's things like that that it's going to be very difficult to find. So, but document your assumptions because you probably will have assumptions as you go through there. And again, just because you have access to a site doesn't mean you're going to be able to collect everything. That's just the nature of it, and it's just it's it's the way the process goes. So again, that gets back into documenting your assumptions from a plan from an. Uh, an I, I don't want to use the word inspector. I prefer the word data collector. It sounds better than auditor, and that should be on our lessons learned is don't use the word audit on this thing because it just is going to turn people off. Data collector is a much more neutral term, you know, you're out there to help them out. So, so to summarize this, and so Mike can get up here and you all can go to the reception because I know Mike's only going to take 10 minutes, right? So. If I had to kind of summarize everything, um, come up with a contingency plan from day one. Realize that not everything is going to go as smoothly as you might think. It looks great on paper when you actually get out there to start doing this. You need a plan B. 
We scrambled in Nevada. We had 140 buildings we had to find. Okay, what did we do? We bought data. We knew consultants down in there that were actually either doing Energy Star work or Energy Code compliance. There was a core group of consultants in Southern Nevada. We went to them and say, hey, we need your help. We need some data in there. We still got to the same place, and I still, we, it worked from a regional standpoint, but you have to have a plan B on this whole thing. You have to determine the question that must be answered first before developing the data collection program. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to find? What, what do you want answered? Now, for us, it's 90% compliance, but is that all? Are you going to want more information when you're out there? Um, maybe you want to understand process better. Maybe you want to do marketing to these people. I mean, get, get your assumption set up first before you even get the program going. Get the most out of the process. This kind of goes with the second bullet. If you're out there and have contact with these people, Make, use it to your advantage. Build relationships, okay? Do your marketing. You're kind of the, they, they have to make this, the, uh, the energy codes work out in the state from a state energy office standpoint. You're in a role, role to help them out. Be kind of the white knight person that can actually come out there saying, we're the government and we're here to help. I know that doesn't go over well, well but this, it actually, you know, this is offer the technical assistance and things like that so they can come back to you. Ensure, what's that? One minute. Ensure autonomy. This is a key. No one likes to be told that they're doing a bad job. No one likes to be told that their buildings don't comply. And no one likes to see it press that X builder is doing a lousy job with energy code compliance. Okay? You have to ensure autonomy out on site with the jurisdictions and with the builders. And this is a very, very important thing. This is key. And then last but not least, use the process to strengthen ties with the building design and enforcement industry. Again, this is a great outreach effort. Use it as marketing, but get out there and talk to them and use it, kind of get them on your side with this. And that is it. And I, I'm sure there are no questions about what I have, So because you will use them all up on Linda. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Mike then.